Hello and welcome back. And that is right. Today we want to talk about another DIY NAS motherboard. This is a new ITX motherboard from CWWK. This is the Q670. This is an 8 bay, so 8 bay SATA MITX motherboard that supports both Gen 5 and Gen 4. Now, when you do get a hold of it, it's going to set you back about $239 to $250, depending on where you shop around. There are combos available for another $10 or $20 that include. Um, fan out cables such as the SFF to SATA that you're going to need. There's two ports on board there. There's also a John's Bow CPU cooler version that you can get, a low profile one that's included within that bundle. So, although you're going to have to supply your own CPU and supply your own memory, I will say for an ITX motherboard out the gate for an 8 bay that is supporting LGA 7, uh, 1700 CPUs there or uh, 170, this motherboard already left me impressed. Now, I've already reviewed the previous version of this motherboard. This is the second one of this series, uh, you know, promising things like Gen 5 architecture and supporting your know, vPro on one of those Intel ports that allows for remote management, that sort of thing. But they really scaled things up on this. Now, why is that? Well, let's dig in. First and foremost, it's that Gen 4 slash Gen 5 architecture. What does that mean in real terms? Well, obviously, it's going to be heavily dependent on the CPU you choose to use, and this supports uh, Intel 12th, 13th, and 14th generation processors there. Again, so you're looking at scaling from, you know, a Pentium or an i3 all the way up to an i9. I was testing with an i5 on this, and although I will talk about stuff with power consumption and some other bits later on, it's worth highlighting these are incredibly relative to the process you use. And also, likewise, if you do want to take advantage of the Intel V Pro output, it is on the second 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port. There's two 2.5 gig ports there. And you have to make sure you use minimum an i5 in order to take advantage of that. But the Gen 5 and Gen 4 architecture I'm talking about, well, remember I mentioned just now that this has a couple of SFF to SATA outputs. So we got those there just underneath the memory. And those there allow for four SATA connected drives on each of them. But more importantly, this system has two M.2 slots on the rear, and the two M.2 slots, one of them is 2280, the other one is 22110, the uh, lengthier SSDs there in the market, so support things like PLP or large capacity drives. There's also a third M.2 NVMe tucked neatly there just behind the individual external outputs. Now, all three of those, again, it's going to depend on the CPU you choose to use, are Gen 4 times 4 architecture each. That means you can crack a 6, 7 gigabytes per second SSD in three of those. This motherboard has got three Gen 4 times 4 slots, but it doesn't end there because on top of that, we have a Gen 5 times 16 PCIe output. Now, again, CPU lanes, blah, blah, blah. It's all going to make a vast amount of difference which one you use, but with support, by the way, of 2 times 8 by verification on here, it means that you can apply and add big old cards like this one. This card that we talked about before, the OWC uh, Excelsior or Accelerator card there, it's got eight M.2 NVMEs at Gen 4, and you can take advantage of that inside this, or use by free location, use risers to get even more out of this. So that's three Gen 4 M.2 NVMEs there, and the PCO Gen 5 slot there that allows you to add even more. Now, there's going to be some of you saying, well, 2 times 2.5 GPU is frankly a little bit limiting for that kind of internal spec. And, you know, let's face it, you've probably got a point. How exactly are you going to scale that up? You don't want to waste a Gen 5 times 16 slot on a poxy 10G card, not even a dual pot 10 GPU card. Now, of course, you could scale up 25, 40, 100 gig card or use M.2 to 10 GPU adapters or M.2 to PCIe adapters. We've talked about enough on the channel. Adapters like these, we've talked about this one before. This is the IO Crest M.2 to 10 GPU adapters. If you wanted to say, one of your M.2s, you could add 10 GBE that easily. You could go for again the rise that we just mentioned. This is a Gen 4 riser here. This is only 25 nicker, and it allows you to add a big card. Don't get me wrong, you're still limited to four times four, but at least you can use the big card. And even then, you've got USB Type C to five gigabit Ethernet adapters on the market for like $30. And with this having also on the rear a 20 gig USB C port as well, 
there's a lot of scalability on a motherboard like this. Again, keep it in mind, this is an MITX, something that you don't really expect to be in the same associated sentence as most of the stuff I've said over the preceding four and a half minutes. And it's not all good news, at least not for everyone. This device, as you may already notice when I was waving it around, it doesn't support sodium, which is what you normally associate with a lot of MITX motherboards currently when they're trying to maximize space and efficiency. This takes advantage of full UDIM. Now, on the one hand, kind of annoying but it wouldn't annoy me so much i don't think if it was ecc but unfortunately this doesn't support ecc i know a lot of the cpus we talked about didn't anyway but this doesn't have support of ecc now those two slots there support up to 5600 megahertz memory on ddr5 again you can put 48 in each going up to a total of 96 gigabytes of memory which again on an mitx is mwah, beautiful but it just always bums me out when i'm going to use full dim memory and there isn't any support of ecc i get it they made a cpu choice there and ecc support in the mitx level is actually pretty barren for most cases but it's still kind of annoying that that's there uh, you have to use uh, an at XPSU, it's got the standard 20 pin ATX output there, and the connectors are all fairly standard for the F, F panel and stuff like that, and the USB front panel as well, all connects pretty smoothly. Now, returning to those M.2 NVMe slots there, they're all Gen 4x4, I ran the same tests on all three of them, and again, that was using that 12th generation i5 uh, that I mentioned earlier on, and the performance was largely the same, so just zooming in on just one of them there. When I was uh, checking the read and write performance, uh, the read performance, uh, of a consistent, uh, I believe, 90 individual uh, repeated tests of one gigabyte creation. Uh, at right, we saw 3.7 to uh, 3.8 gigabytes per second repeat, and we saw around 5 to 5.6 gigabytes per second repeat read there. So good numbers. Again, I know that SSDs in there may promote 7 gigabytes per second, but within uh, tapping into SSH via Unraid, these are still pretty respectable numbers for an MITX motherboard with the CPU I choose to use there. Now, one of the things that wasn't as good was transferring data between SSDs. So I did a uh, similar SSD, uh, SSH command, moving data between SSD1 and SSD2. And then I saw performance go down to around 1 gig to 1.1 gigabytes per second. Now, that's not unusual to not see the same performance because we are performing a simultaneous read-write action. But I really thought I'd see 2.5 there moving data between them it's not the end of the world but if you were going to go ahead and try and write some ssd together rather than relying on the sata that we just mentioned earlier on i think you wouldn't see ideal performance and ultimately that's another reason why i think you could use this as a flash server but i would have separate pools or at the very least those pools acting as hot data moving data periodically over to warm or even cold data onto the two lots of hard drives and lastly, although it is supremely relative when it comes to the power consumption of this device, again, using that i5, when it was in idle, I saw the i5 uh, eating around 30 to 31 watts. And again, that was the i5-1250. And when I was doing active utilization there, and this was utilizing all of the SSDs and two hard drives, it went between 57 and 58. And that was using 30 to 50% up and down uh, occasionally on Unraid, uh, read and writing to those disks repeatedly. So again, Pretty good numbers, but not really something you can use other than just vague guidance, because I don't know what processor you're going to opt for. Bottom line, an 8-bay MITX motherboard for between 239 and 249, you know, obviously you're going to have to factor in your memory, your case, your CPU, your cables or whatever, but this is a phenomenal start to a very comprehensive 8-bay solution. What do I not like? I hate the lack of ECC, given that most of the kind of physical architecture is leaning heavily on the idea that ECC would be possible on this. And let's be realistic, although I love the VPro there using identity endpoint and being able to go in remotely onto an almost BIOS comparative level remotely is fantastic for those in the know on their server. But the lack of 10GBE native to this, I feel there's ways where that PCIe arch architecture that's been spread across, perhaps if it had only been a times uh, five, five times eight slot there, or bringing it down, I'm sure there would have been ways to introduce 10GBE onto this. But I know overall, I'm probably in the minority there, given there's a degree of expandability in every which way and loose on this device. So those criticisms aside, I wish... CWWK had a bundled version of this. Uh, I'd love to see an AMD alternative.
limited to, and I'm pretty sure that would have ECC. But overall, for the price point, for the capability, for the design, and just generally for ticking so many boxes, I still heavily recommend this. Just keep in mind, it is MITX. There are inherent limitations with regards to PC upgrade uh, ability. And if you're someone, and I know not everyone is, that doesn't want to use SFF fan out, this isn't going to be for you. There is not a single hard traditional SAR on that. But let me know what you think. There's a written review in the description below, linked over at NAS Compares. We're going to a little bit more detail about the temp testing. And hopefully I want to get a chance. I'll test a couple more CPUs on this. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. If you do want to get hold of this yourself, there's links in the description. If you're interested in getting hold of it, and if this video has helped, and if you were going to go to the shops listed below anyway, make sure those three things are true. Please use those links. Doing so will result in a small commission to me and Eddie here at NAS Compares. It's genuinely just us doing this and it really helps us out thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time